A very good evening and welcome to one and all present here for this webinar on Dento Farm 2022 on managing the secret world of oral microbiome by phytotherapeutic approach. I am Dr. Ramya, part of Dental Education Unit and Senior Lecturer at Sri Balaji Dental College and Hospital. We'll be highlighting you about this program today. I would like to welcome our chairperson, Dr. Sri Nisha Ma'am, Registrar Dr. Bhuminathan Sir and Principal Dr. Jimson Sir and Dr. Sumati Jones Ma'am, Head of the Department of Pharmacology at Sri Balaji Dental College and Hospital. Over to Sumati Ma'am to share a few words on today's webinar. Welcome to the delegates present for this webinar. Uh, good evening. Today's topic uh, will be based on uh, oral microbiome. And uh, I would like to thank the management uh, for giving this platform. Tentoform as such is the platform to interact uh, different uh, uh, multidisciplinary area uh, of the research with um, top most scientists across the world. Our ma'am, Dr. Um, Sashmita, is well versed in this field. And then, uh, as such, she has uh, repeated uh, publications and has, she has uh, many number of uh, research publications, the reputed paper, reputed journals. And uh, her field of research uh, is mainly on uh, phytotherapeutic approach. And uh, she'll be discussing the same with you. You can interact with her with your questions. And uh, I'll move on to ma'am now. Uh, this webinar is all about the Im imbalances in the oral microbiome and phytotherapeutic modalities as an interventional approach beneficial to wide range of participants from this multidisciplinary field. Uh, just a little announcement on housekeeping before we get started. So if you have any queries during the presentation, please type, in the, uh, type the questions in the link provided in the comment box. After the presentation, we will have time for questions at the end. Now, I warmly welcome the guest speaker of today's webinar, Dr. Sasmita Mishra, speaker who is a faculty in the Department of Biology, Dorte and George Henning College of Science, Mathematics and Technology at Keene University. She, is specialized, she specialized in plant physiology, plant nutrition, and molecular biology, and also teaches various courses in biology, including botany, microbiology, genetics, and medicinal botany. Her research focuses on response of plants to abiotic stress, plant nutrition, relation, and phytotherapeutic application of plants. Dr. Shashmita Mishra obtained her doc uh, uh, doctoral degree from the University of Delhi, India, and has conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Toledo, Ohio, in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In addition to teaching, Dr. Shashmita Mishra has primary research, including understanding plant-nutrient relation during abiotic stress using genomics and proteomics approaches. During her postdoctoral training at the University of Toledo, she developed biomarkers for nutrient uptake proteins to study the plant nutrient relations and also generated 17 peer reviewed articles. Expanding her research interest at Keene University, her lab is conducting studies on the roles of symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi on abiotic stress tolerance in plants and also evaluating the potential therapeutic applications of medicinal plants. Now, without any further delay, we will time over to the speaker, Dr. Sashmita Mishra. Thank you, Dr. Ramya, and thank you, Dr. Jones. It's a pleasure to be here in this and a part of this uh, webinar. Um, it's uh, when it comes to uh, a topic like this particular, like you now when I initially, when I got the invitation from Dr. Jones regarding um, like, you know, presenting a seminar, um, I was a little bit thinking of like, you know, what will be really a very great uh, uh, a topic, which is like, you know, we all should know and how that will help really to our student audience particularly. And feel free to ask me any question you have and uh, I'll be happy to answer that. So uh, I will not take much time. And also, even though my main uh, research area is uh, understanding the plant nutrient relationship during the climate change 
uh, during the era of climate change. Today, I'm not going to address any of my that aspect of uh, research, but today I'm going to share with you um, about another unique approach, which is like, you know, my most a dream project kind of thing, wherein how we can use this phytotherapeutic approach to uh, deal with various health issues. And this is what is I'm going to share with you um, today. Oh, I think, okay, here we go. So I split my talk into three different parts and I, I will make sure that I'm not going to really stretch it too long. And feel free to ask me a question. Feel free to like, if you want to interrupt me, interrupt me, or if you have any question in between, please feel free to share with me. Okay, so managing the secret world of oral microbiome. And I further, as I mentioned, like I break down this uh, talk into three different uh, part. First, I'm going to share with you what exactly the oral microbiomes are and uh, what are the, what we learned so far and how some of the good and bad microbiome, and we need to keep the good microbiome with us. And also we need to deal with the, we need to kind of like you know, get rid of the, uh, the bad microbiome. When I'm saying good or bad, I'm saying that like, you know, based on their colonization and based on many things we have to, and that's what is, what is, what are the different methods to explore to identify those and to learn more about this oral microbiome. And at the end, I'm going to uh, share with you about the some of the phytotherapeutic approach. And this is what is kind of a like upcoming field and we don't have many proven uh, methods and I'm going to share with you some examples. So let's start from oral microbiome. And overall, what exactly microbiome are? Microbiomes are the complex ecosystem of microorganism. Believe me or not, like, you know, and you all are expert in this. I don't know. I mean, you, you know, more than me, when, whenever I go to a dentist, I always am scared of showing my teeth to the dentist because we have, this is the second largest population or second largest group of microorganism, which is again residing in our mouth. Now, can you tell me which one is the first one? The gut microbiome, right? When we are saying or using the word microbiome means we are talking about many microorganisms. And those microorganisms, they live with us, they are living with us, they are helping us, or sometimes they are causing problem also. So these oral microbiota or the oral microflora or the oral microbiome, again, you will find that it varies from person to person. 99.5% of human have identical genetic map makeup, but when we look at the oral microbiome, then you'll find huge differences. And that's what is always a bit of challenge when we look into and when we learn about and when we want to like you know, move further, how to fix the problem with rest of the pathogenic oral microbiome. That's what I'm going to share with you with a couple of examples. I'm sorry, I am a little bit of, okay, here we go. So what exactly, did I skip another slide now? So what exactly the microbiome types are? As you can see here, there are two types, the core microbiome and the variable microbiome. What is the difference? The difference is core microbiome, they're all set. They don't change even though we, with, uh, and they are present in the given habitat right from our childhood, right from the pot. But the variable microbiome, these variable microbiomes are individuals based on uh, the individual's uh, lifestyle, based on the individual host genotypes, host physiology, host immune system, transient community member, host environment, host uh, patho pathobiology. And there are many other factors which can also change or help in uh, changing the variable microbiome. And this is what is when we are looking at the total microbiome, always it is difficult to find also often like, you know, whether uh, which one is a core microbiome and which one is our individual microbiome. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, that the core microbiome always remain constant, but the variable microbiome, it keeps on changing from childhood to like with the age of growth and development, everything, it changes. And also whether I'm taking more 
soda or i am taking more water or i am drinking more of the sweet or salty food everything can contribute to colonization and the population of the variable microbiome by saying that when we look into this uh, inside the oral microbiome and by, uh, and we are mainly focusing on the variable microbiome as you can see here and as i mentioned earlier the first largest community with is located within our gut in our stomach and the second largest ecosystem you'll find is again the oral microbiome so what kind of species what kind of microorganisms you'll find in the oral microbiome and always our first thing is go i mean whenever we use the term microbiome we think like it's only bacteria you'll find bacteria you'll find fungi you will find viruses archaea and protozoa these are all you can as you can see here these are all residing and they are colonizing at different stages but very rarely like you know when you look at all these microbiome all these microorganisms again always you'll find bacteria comes at the topmost position then some of the archaea but rest of it is really very rare to get the fungal and these are some of the fungal species i believe we are able to read some of the names over here and then based on their colonization based on their population then you'll find they will either they will make any cavity or they can make any other dental issues so that's the reason before treating or before uh, proceeding for a anything like before using any drugs or any other treatment we need to know what exactly the individual person might have and what is the cause and this is where we when we look into the application of learning more about the oral microbiome and that's why we should uh, focus on some of the things what uh, and that's what is one of the part i kept like you know i mentioned i'm going to talk a little more about the methods moving forward as you can see here this is what is how many species where exactly they are located in our mouth so well oral microbiome are very good in adjusting or like occupying any habitat they are good in evolving as per the, our food habit or many different other conditions so there are somewhere around 700 different species as you can see here they can stay they can live they can live happily without any problem inside the mouth as you can see here sometimes you'll find them in the subganglion plaque this is what is you have a very nice white teeth and gradually you see there is a slight change in the color and then that means like you know we are definitely giving allowing someone to live on our teeth then also you see the uh, i mean different surfaces on the surface of tooth then also this is the palate and there are soft tissues and of course throat tonsil tongue and there are many other uh, places as you can see including the lips so if you just simply swab a sample and then plate it you can see how many different types of microorganisms you'll find and that's what we do in our microbiology lab we just take a teeth swab and then simply we culture on a plate then we'll be able to see plenty of microorganisms so basically and here when we look at the like the different species over here we cannot say like you know what exactly whether it's a bacteria or fungi or viruses or archaea or any other type but the protozoans archaea and uh, rest of these are like you know these are the less possible chances but again if you rank their number or rank like you know what kind of microorganisms i will find in any of the saliva sample then always like you know the topmost one is bacteria followed by fungi and of course some of the viruses very good so we can also like you know as i mentioned earlier that some of these microorganism based on their relationship with us or particularly with our tooth you'll find three different types of oral microbiome find some of them with symbiotic relationship some will be with a commensal relationship and some microorganisms you'll find as pathogenic now what is the difference symbiotic relation i'm sure you uh, everyone knows like you know this is a mutual relationship between the microorganisms and also with our with their habitat and with the with the 
particularly with our teeth, gum, and everything. So symbiotic microorganism, they live and they take whatever we are, whatever food we are eating. It is not really, they are not harming, rather they are helping us in processing. Some of those are helping us in maintaining the blood pressure. Some of them are helping, helping us in digestion process. And while we are, uh, like even though they are some microorganisms, also they are part of the oral microbiome and also they are part of the gut microbiome. Commensal population always, they are kind of little bit of, sometimes they can act as an opportunistic bacterial, uh, I mean, a microorganism species also, but they don't cause any harm. Rather, they will make, their, they will colonize and they will check on the pathogenic species, but by inhibiting them or by blocking them so that they cannot colonize and the pathogenic species will not colonize when the commensal species are there in the uh, oral microbiome. Pathogenic in contrast, they always, they are looking for something so that they can colonize and they can take over the rest of the good bacteria. So that's why oral microbiome can be a friend or can be foe. And everything is controlled again, mainly or primarily on very different type of habitat. For example, as I mentioned, a couple of things over here, host diet, pH of saliva, and also interaction among all those organisms or the species within the, within the host or the within the living host. Many of these uh, oral microbiome, again, like in changing, and this is what is one of the major factor. And that's the reason like when you look at, uh, a gen, I mean, uh, recent data on during the COVID period, how we are concerned about like changing of the oral uh, microbiome population because sometimes like in you know, our food habitat change significantly during the pandemic time and this is what is one of the main concern and one of the major thing we need to really consider when we are looking at the oral microbiome maybe in past one year or two years how they evolve rapidly when it since uh, we are focusing on mainly on the like you know different microorganisms and particularly here you can see the Bacteria. Bacteria are always like, you know, they outcompete with the rest of the oral microorganisms. So, so that's why I emphasize a little more on the different microbial species. As you can see here, we have gram positive and gram negative species, which are highly or which are uh, the dominant microorganisms again in the oral microbiome. And these are again like, you know, these are the some example of healthy when we are looking at healthy oral cavity then these are the uh, different types of different groups of uh, gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So again, like little bit, I'm sure we all are familiar with these two terms, the gram positive and the gram negative. This is what is based on the gram strain, whether they are retaining the crystal violet strain or they are retaining the secondary strain, then we are further characterizing the group of bacteria into a gram positive or gram negative. So on the left hand side, you can see a list of different gram positive bacteria, which is most commonly uh, or which are the part of the oral microbiome. For example, you'll find them in different form also. So that's why, uh, as you can see here, some you'll find in the caucus form, some in the rod or the bacilli form. And also uh, you'll see like, you know, these are the different species. And always whenever you do a teeth swab, mostly you'll find the streptococcus that's predominant and also some of the species of lactobacillus or uh, even ex, uh, this um, eubacterium. So these are some of the common colonizer you'll find even with a healthy a person with healthy oral cavity or person with healthy gum. On my right hand side, you can see here the gram list of gram negative bacteria. And these are again in different <clears throat> two different groups of gram negative bacteria based on their morphotypes or the, based on their morphology, like Moraxella, Nizaria, and some of sometimes and also many more. I don't want to really read their name, and some are like you know kind of uh, we are already very familiar with uh, their names, so that's why uh, sometimes we use them as a kind of a marker. Just when we are plating, then we can take like you know, a control, a, a, selecting a control, and then we can compare like what kind of microorganisms uh, we might have in the unknown sample. Moving further, 
when you see these different types of uh, bacteria and how they colonize and gradually how they are changing their colonization is again like you know, surrounding the teeth this is a little bit of like you know a nice a comparison of a healthy versus the periodontitis which is again i am give me a, sorry so <clears throat> so as you can see here this is what is a a uh, portion of the healthy part of our teeth and then you can see gradually different stages you can compare that with the color change for example this early colonizer which is and then middle colonizer and the late colonizer so what is the difference over here the early colonizer gradually like you'll find them in uh, like the species which is mostly they are the one they can pretty much grow in every habitat by saying that no matter what is the ph no matter what is the rest of like you know the food habit and slowly slowly you'll find them colonizing towards the inner portion of the gum and also inner portion of the teeth and then you can find see the middle colonizer and always the late colonizer and when we reach up to this stage then definitely this is the time we need to go to a dentist right so what kind of species when we are looking at the early colonizers or the middle colonizer and the late colonizer so these are some of the species again gradually they grow and then they reside and they build their niche uh, in our gum or the oral cavity so for example if we are looking at the some of the early colonizer streptococci actinomycetes and <clears throat> a couple of many more and these are some of the species which is again you can see uh, they are uh, uh, these are the two species of middle colonizer and these are again some of the late colonizer so and this is of course this is not my research this is what is one uh, i collected from one of the most recent study and this is what will give us a clue on like you know what kind of organisms we have and what is the next step another important aspect of when we are looking at the microbiome microbiome itself is a very big term and also when we are using the term microbiome we are not not only like in addressing only one microorganism we are talking about hundred thousands of millions of microorganisms so we have in order to how we learn about the oral <clears throat> microbiome as you can see here the oral microbiome the human oral microbiome database this is what is one of the part of the human genome project and now we have the human oral microbiome project project which is also known as the homd and here you'll find the deposition or the repository of the oral bacteria in in various form and you can see here we have specimen from saliva and those are again deposited in those database so what is the basis of and how we are generating this database mainly we are collecting these different oral microorganisms and they are submitting after sequencing and i'm going to talk more about the methods and after their sequence we are uh, <clears throat> sequencing at the 16s ribosomal rna and then that based on this we are depositing or submitting in a specific database and that's what is again like you know across the globe we can use that database and then we can learn more about the microbiome any specific microbiome and until now we have 482 taxa entire whole genome sequence from different part for example you can see here saliva green color is teeth and tongue and this is what is the complex picture of the human oral microbiome out of those um, different species again approximately 772 are prokaryotic species and out of these total microorganisms we are able to identify 70 percent cultivable and 30 percent uncultivable now what is the difference between these the difference is cultivables are we are able to culture them we are able to learn more about them we can say also like whether it is a gram positive gram negative if it is a bacteria or it is a fungus or it is any other microorganisms the rest 30 percent is uncultivable by saying that we're able to identify them but we are not able to find them or culture them in an active form 
So that's why we're using the term again, cultivable versus the uncultivable. And out of these 70% of cultivable, we have 50%, 57% of taxonomic identity. So by saying the taxonomic identity, we have, uh, we have their gene sequence, or we have some sort of sequence, for example, <coughs> excuse me, 16S RNA, For example, we have 16 as uh, ribosomal RNA, and based on the RNA sequence, then we further align that, and then we, based on the sequence alignment, then that has to be matched with a sequence uh, uh, data, and then that is further like like and again also we have in addition to that we have the gram stain or depending on the staining methods or various other methods you should be able to identify them. So this is what is. As of now, we have 57% of uh, micro, microbiome with a fixed or with a accurate taxonomic identity. So, based on this is, and this is a very huge amount of data and I uh, didn't emphasize much on what exactly, but in a very concise manner, when we are looking to this different, uh, the 16S ribosomal uh, profiling, then you'll find there are six broad phyla, as you can see here. And these are the names. And again, out of them, 96% again, we are looking at only for our oral microbiome. Okay, so moving further, uh, we have, we learn about a little bit basic of what kind of microorganism we expect and what are the different uh, approaches. Now I'm going to share with you the methods to identify and characterize oral microbiome. Here you can have a very simple method, just like do a, a staining technique, a quick staining method, a very basic method and observe under the microscope. You have a swab, make a smear, look under the microscope. Sometimes the staining method will work, sometimes the staining method will not work and you will not get a solid concrete result what kind of microorganism you have in your collected sample. Then the second step is you have to, you have to plate it or you have to culture it. De depending upon what kind of media you have, you can either culture on uh, different specific media, but I would like to share with you how these methods of analyzing or identifying this oral microbiome has been evolved in addition to the evolution of the oral microflora itself. Starting from middle, mid 600, 1600, as you can see here, this is what is a chart. And of course it is showing beyond 2010, but like, you know, now of course, like, you know, we have, we started from a very basic techniques and then 80s, 1980s is actually, it is the time wherein we come up with various breakthrough techniques. And then further moving forward, we have, the human microbiome project which is uh, again uh, um, in 2008 it has been initiated and it is still going on because as i mentioned like you know all these microorganisms are changing with the change of the habitat so that's why um and we have uh, launched uh, i mean somewhere in two years later 2010 2010 we have uh, the full database of uh, the microbiome and then now we are using, of course, we're using, using the database and we are adding those microorganisms, adding those database in order to like, you know, to share with, and it is actually, it is public also. And we are getting, collecting all our information from this database. So, so look at like, you know, from the basic to the applied and with the evolution of technique, we are able to identify and find out, learn more about the oral microbiome. <clears throat> Little bit about the sample collection. So as you can see here, the sample collection for when we are interested in learning more about what are the methods actually we should follow and what where should I start? So usually like you can collect sample and you don't need to really have a five gram or 10 gram of sample. You just have a swab and that swab will help you further like you know, you are extracting DNA, RNA or protein based on your uh, method of identifying 
and then you can have different sample collection and then you can use that further for the next step an example of the taking a swab and culturing on plate as you can see here this is uh, one particular uh, species of microorganisms and when you culture them in blood agar plate then you can see how from different location and you can see the different microorganisms sometimes you are getting also fungal sample also on the blood agar and this is uh, the manitol salt agar and this is another type of media which is again the dextrose agar and then you can see the colonization of these different microorganisms of course this is the same sample collected from different location and then culture on different media so what we learn from here well by looking at this i can say that whether i have one bacteria or i have a group of bacteria or i have fungal species but i don't know whether what kind of bacteria is that i don't know what kind of fungal species is that i don't know whether any other archaea or any other microorganisms are there so this is not giving us a clear picture of what kind of microorganisms i do have i have in my sample so further we need to move here and like you know from here we can again look further into either the gene or protein or simply you can like you know use a microscope and look under the microscope and you can observe what kind of microorganisms you have based on that you have to select a right staining method or right method for for like you know identifying the bacteria or identifying based on like what exactly you got on the plate this is a complex plate and this is really like you know the specimen is having mixture of everything there are many other methods and uh, as you see here this is uh, dzge which is again if i uh, this is one of the most widely used method also wherein uh, and also this is culture independent technology by saying that you have a sample but you don't want to culture that but you directly take into uh, you, you will take it into like you know you'll, uh, you'll you don't need to culture it when i'm saying culture means you are not culturing on a petri plate straight you are taking into observing like you know what 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 are the other microorganisms or what exactly the microorganisms as you can see here these are in vivo in vitro biofilm and then again like we are looking at the saliva and the diversity among the biofilm so So this method, the denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis. So what exactly we do in this method? Basically, when we have, we extract the uh, DNA and then we use restriction enzyme and then we chop the DNA into several part and then we'll get different fragments. Then when you run against the electrophoresis, then you'll be able to see the different band. And this is what is again in the form of uh, the sample of the bacterial disease pattern, as you can see here. Number of bands based on their DNA and based on the fragments. And then you can see that and then you have to match that against a control. Um, there are various other methods also in addition to this DGGE method. That's what is I'm going to show you in, the, in this slide. The polymerase chain reaction based method or the PCR method. One big advantage of PCR method is it, it is uh, much more sophisticated in the sense like it's much more also accurate. And you can have a polymerase chain reaction on the basis of you can use different types of uh, uh, random uh, amplified polymorphic DNA and you can select arbitrary primer. You, you can have different type of primers and then based on the primer sequence, you can again like, you know, characterize the different fragments and then you can find out and you can identify that what kind of fragment is what is the dna sequence and whether it's like you can you can run a gel or you can you don't need to run a gel so this is what is for the like quantitative methods or like you know you can get quantitative data or qualitative data so if you want to run a gel after the pcr polymerase chain reaction you can run a gel and then you can you should be able to find out and match with a standard marker and then you can say this is what is the fragment and this is what is 
whether my unknown sample has uh, similarity with such and such molecular base marker and such and such uh, organism. When even the regular PCR versus the real-time PCR, again, like in a real-time PCR, PCR is more quantitative and it's based on the city value. You will be able to calculate the city value and then you by record reading at your graph. Sometimes the machine is doing everything and just you need to compare the graph and you should be able to share. I have animation over here, but some reason like my animation is not showing in the slide. Um, I think I believe it's because of the compatibility. So the quantitative PCR and also, also the most recent method is now the droplet digital PCR. So the last one is actually, this is what is the most recent technology, which is uh, even much more accurate than the real time PCR in terms of their copy number. How many copy number of that particular uh, organism I have. And that's what is again, when we when you do the droplet digital PCR, then you should be able to accurately tell that how many copy number and you'll get very detailed information. And that's what is we're referring now as the industrial standard, industrial grade, wherein we should be able to tell a little more detail about the microorganism. Another method, as you can see here, this is what is the omic approach. And the omic approach is again based on the host microbe interaction, as you can see here. <clears throat> there are four, four omic ap approaches. The DNA-based approach, RNA-based approach, protein-based, and metabolized based. So based on our target, we have to, if I'm looking for the DNA based, then 16S ribosomal RNA or 18S or the ITS gene. This is what is, these are some of the most common method or most common sequencing method. And then we compare the different sequences and then we can identify the, compare the sequence and then we can, uh, we have, we need to do a rigorous bioinformatics analysis. As you can see here, some sample, some example over here, and then we insert that data into the gene sequence. And that's what is again, like another uh, approach or by the approach of the bioinformatics analysis. You can, you can see, I'm sorry, I'm keeping on the, somewhere I'm clicking and it's turning off my video. Sorry for that. <laughs> so the DNA based approach, as you can see here, you have, you have to take a uh, collect the DNA and then like, you know, you have to run through and based on, you have to use the different uh, specific primer based on your goal, whether you are able to, you want to look for the 16S or 18S or the ITS. And then metagenomic data is again, like, you know, you are comparing all these individual organisms, their total genome, and then you are able to say, and you are submitting that to the, uh, <clears throat> to the database, database, sorry. RNA based approach is again, we look forward further, like, you know, when we are looking at the what exactly what is the role of the specific targeted gene. And then basically, here we are extracting the messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA will tell us, like, you know, wherein we are separating uh, based on the messenger RNA, we should be able to, comparing the messenger RNA, we'll be able to address answer a little more specific question when we look at the host microbe interaction. Protein is always like, you know, if you remember the, the central dogma, DNA to RNA and RNA to protein. So protein will give you even more clue, but again, sometimes it's really difficult or challenging to uh, correlate like, you know, protein versus the RNA and versus the DNA. But when it comes to protein, you will get even a more transparent picture of how they are interacting with the host how they are, uh, what exactly, what protein they are producing, whether they are making any signaling protein or they are making any different, any specific protein, which is helping colonization of other microorganisms or making more number of the similar microorganism. And that's why that is one of the most popular approach also in order to see when we are interested in learning more about the colonization of the oral microbiome. Out of all these three methods, this is what is again like, you know, you can see here, I mentioned about, you can see a small icon of the LCMS. So based on our target, we have to use different types of equipment, different types of methodology. And uh, based on our question, we have to, and then obviously like, you know, 
what exactly I'm getting here? Here I'm getting the DNA data. Here I'm getting the RNA data, and here I'm getting the protein data. And ultimately, that is what is going to the database, and we can share with the entire scientific society that this is what is specific to such and such microorganism. Now, metabolite-based approach is a little different than all these three approach. Here we are looking at what type of biomolecules or what chemicals, biochemicals are generated by when we are looking for specific host microbe interaction. What kind of specific biomolecule? It can be DNA, it can be RNA, it can be protein, or it can be any other metabolomic. Metabolomic means whatever metabolites, for example, how many different types of sugar they are making. Are they making more amount of lipids? Are they making more amount of some specific amino acid? So all those answers we'll get from when we are looking at the metabolite-based approach. And omic approach is even like, you know, much more specific, much more uh, uh, transparent as compared to rest of the when we are looking for some specific uh, microorganism and particularly host microbe interaction then this omic approach is one of the most highly used approach. But also in addition to that, when we are looking at the 16R, uh, 16S uh, ribosomal RNA sequencing, I'm sorry that some, something is kind of overlapped here. So this sequence technique involved, and this is what is like most widely used method. Now also, even though we have many modern methodology, many modern technology, but we are using this 16S RNA sequencing is one of the most highly used method. Basically, we are uh, looking at the conserved uh, 16S uh, ribosomal RNA gene, as you can see here. And then this is again sequenced at various position of the chromosome. And and why 16S ribosomal RNA? Because of this region, as you can see here, I highlighted a couple of regions. Why this is one of the most widely used method, as you can see here. You'll find this 16S uh, ribosomal RNA in all bacteria. Also, you'll find them as a kind of a family marker also. Okay, whether it's gram positive or gram negative. So that's why it's most widely used. Also, it is involved in several gene function. And that particular gene function will not change from time to time. So when we are looking at the core microbiome or the, uh, or the, the other type of microbiome, then we are still able or the variable microbiome. Then also like, you know, when we are sequencing the 16S ribosomal RNA, then you should be able to uh, compare because kind of it remain constant throughout the colonization or throughout, throughout their uh, the time when this microbiome is residing in the oral environment. And there are many more also like, you know, because of the sequence size and all. So this is what is one of the most preferable, preferable method. In addition to that, the most latest, greatest and fancy technology, I always say that's the next generation sequencing. You'll be surprised that next generation sequencing has been revolutionized the study of microbial diversity. Why? We don't need to really wait for like, you know, I send a sequence and I need to wait for months to get my data. That is not, uh, that has been completely changed. Within 24 hours, we are able to get a blueprint of everything. And that's what is all about the next generation sequencing. Also, it's not giving only like, you know, the superficial, sequence it's give, giving us a detailed deep sequence and in, on a large scale basis and that's why this next generation sequencing is really highly preferable as compared to even the omic approach of course when we are talking about the next generation sequencing we should not forget the analysis part a rigorous bioinformatic analysis is required when we are getting the sequence genome sequence from the next generation sequencing here are some of the example of different types of the NGS technology, as you can see here. 4-5-4 uh, pyro sequencing, applied biosystem, Illumina process, specific biosequences, and Oxford nanopore. These are the, uh, nanopore. These are the actually different types of sequencing um, 
ng ngs sequencing based on our availability based on what kind of sample we have and many other factors and these are the different types of next generation sequencing widely used across the globe in order to learn more about oral microbiome so overall like if we summarize the general overview of little bit again like you know here a flow chart of uh, the 16s ribosomal rna i have a very nice animation over here but unfortunately i'm unable to share with you all my uh, animated uh, slides but this is what is a again like a generalized overview of when we how we have to collect the sample and what is the next step uh, after collecting the sample what exactly we have to do uh, we have to follow in order to get our data and uh, particularly the sequencing data and how you have to analyze that so this is all about the methods and these methods are again most uh, widely applied methods and now i am moving on to my third part of the of this presentation the phytotherapeutic approach now when i am saying phytotherapeutic approach phytotherapeutic approach is a plant based approach so what happen is that when we are using because there are many product if you go to any pharmacy you'll find different types of products and some of them are always not really like you know helping us in the sense even though we are able to fix one thing then we are able to like you now breaking we are breaking another uh, thing that's what is happening when we are using any non plant based product most of the time for example like you know risk greater risk of if you are for example if, if you are taking antibiotics for a long run then what happening antibiotics can clear some of the good bacteria we want right and those bacteria are helping us so what is the approach what is the safe way of retaining fulfilling the two targets that we are keeping our good bacteria and also we are avoiding the harmful bacteria so there lies the approach wherein we are using the plant based approach and this is a very uh, even though like you know it's historically we are using this but there is no sufficient scientific evidence in order to learn uh, i mean in order to prove the antimicrobial properties of any plant and also like you know how it is interacting so we are still learning that and one step at a time because it's really when we are looking at this phytotherapeutic as and there are many challenges there are many challenges with my experience when i deal with some of these plant extract i found one thing is that like you now the compound what is the percentage of that compound and where it is located in which plant part whether it is located in the leaves or in flowers or any other plant part so first we have to deal with that once we find that okay then we have to use and there are step by step methods in order to learn or use and prove your hypothesis that this such and such plant can able to control the growth of such and such microorganisms and that's what is again when we are looking at the phytotherapeutic approach we are looking at the plant extract or the plant product why because as i mentioned earlier the phytotherapeutic approach is one of the safest approach and that's what is i'm going to share with you couple of with couple of example uh i'm sure you are familiar with the peppermint oil have you ever seen any of this uh, peppermint plant mint plant is very common you'll find everywhere right scientific name of the mint plant is uh, peppermint plant mentha piperata so you have to extract the oil and exactly which plant part we are using we are using the leaves particularly okay and once you extract the oil that's again like you now it's the kind of a volatile oil and the extraction has to be also when we are using the phytotherapeutic approach it has to be a kind of little uh, it has to be really a bio safe approach by saying that we are not using any harsh chemical we have to use a solvent which is uh, not really harmful for the oral uh, microorganism rest of the oral microorganism but again like you know, it should be effective in controlling the harmful bacteria or harmful microorganism so one example and as you can see here and there are many product i wanted to put many more over here but one good example over here is as you can see here plant based brushing range so what exactly when we are uh, using this well there is a very tiny amount you don't need to use entire bottle at a time you have to use a very small amount 
And this particular extract is again effective against controlling both the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Little bit here, our candidate species is uh, uh, S. pyogen and S. Uh, aureus, which is again the Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus pyogen. These are like, you know, you'll plentifully, it's plentifully available in your oral microflora. And the method, as you can see here, this is what is, you can see the control. And this is uh, against the micro, I mean, we are just uh, making a, collecting the swab and making the bacterial lawn over here. And then in this portion, this is what is a disc uh, assay method, wherein like, you know, you add the, you add tiny amount of like, you know, certain, for example, a small, certain fixed volume. And also all these studies need a lot of, lot of optimization, okay? So you should have your, you know, like, you know, in, because your goal is to, is to find out whether your plant extract is really able to efficiently control the oral microorganism, then you have to take some specific candidate in order to test this, in order to culture them. And then you can see here in both this plate here, this is what is the pyogen. We are unable to see a very good picture over here because of the background reflection. But you can see a clear zone of inhibition. Now, what is the principle behind this method is on the basis of like, if there is any bioactive compound, which is able to control the growth of the microorganism, it will create, it will diffuse to the media and then it will create a zone of inhibition. That zone of inhibition will tell you by measuring this zone of inhibition will tell you again, like, you know, whether it is just controlling or effectively controlling and you can rate them. And this is what is one example of the extract from the paper mint oil extract. And it is able to uh, control both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Okay. Another approach over here, of course, this is not my work. As you can see here, here um, it's uh, three different types of uh, Actually, there are different types of leaf extractor used over here or different plant part, for example, uh, tea tree olive oil, uh, sorry, tea tree, tea tree oil, lavender oil. I'm sure you are familiar with this. And then thyme oil, peppermint oil, and eugenol oil. Eugenol oil is again our clove oil. And clove oil is widely used for any oral problem, the first thing always we look for is the clove oil. Clo clove oil is proven to be very effective for any growth in controlling the growth of any microorganism. So as you can see here, this is what is, you can either follow, follow the method of like the plate based assay, or you can take some broth also, and you can see uh, what is the concentration which is effectively able to control the growth of the microorganism. As you can see here, uh, from lower to higher concentration, two microliter per ml, six micro, four microliter per ml, eight microliter per ml, sixteen and thirty-two. You can see from four microliter until thirty-two microliter, and the higher the number, again, like you know, and you can always we need to measure that. Also, you can always measure, measure either like you know visually, or you can measure uh, by you can do a spectrophotometric analysis in order to measure the bacterial growth. And you can further correlate that whether which concentration is able to effectively control the growth of the microorganisms. So there are many examples, there are many methods. And um, for example, here you can see this is what is from a, uh, again, this is not my paper. I uh, This is uh, different plant species, Salvia officinalis and a couple of Mentha piperata again. And Echinacea purpurea, Echinacea purpurea, I myself, I tried in my lab, but I have like, you know, I didn't look at any uh, microorganism specific to the oral microbiome, but I tried that against the growth of the Pseudomonas E. coli and Staphylococcus, and Echinacea purpurea particularly is able to control the growth of uh, E. coli and also the Pseudomonas. Staphylococcus, I, I was not very successful because there, there are many errors 
or many could be like you know there are many uh, conditions like whether i have a, like you know there are many uh, things like you know maybe there might be some experimental error but my own study say like you know, the acnesia purpurea is effective against and i i'm still like you know pursuing that study and i'm looking forward to uh, like you know to to share more result but this is what is again different plant and their uh, plant extract and then we are looking at the cavity and you can see which is able to control the growth of this cavity and again when we are looking for the phytotherapeutic approach phytotherapeutic approach is always one of the little long run approach in the sense we don't know yet what is the concentration and um like how effectively it is controlling and there are also always the human trial for anything you have to claim as a medicinal purpose then you have to have you have to go through the routine process in vivo in vitro assay and also like human trial when it when it reaches to the human trial that is the most challenging part because there are many uh, protocol we have to follow and that's why like you know when we are looking for the phytotherapeutic approach it is even like you know we are it's now we are focusing but still it's little bit laid behind because of many challenges so what we learn today if we summarize starting from our oral microbiome to the approach which is a safe approach in order to deal with or in order to also protect the good microbiome versus the the harmful microbiome first thing is we should know we need to know about what kind of microorganism is that and what is the background information we learn about by using this technique different techniques and what is the safe method what is the quick method in order to learn about what specific species we have in a patient oral microbiome or the oral microflora that will help us again in planning a treatment wherein whether we are approaching the uh, plant based approach or any uh, specific drugs and this is what is uh, all about like you know when we are learning about the microflora and also what is the uh, what is the method which is like less uh, time consuming and also like we are rapidly getting result and this is what is uh different tools are evolving and so as the microorganisms and always we have like you know today we do one sequence and if i do the same sequence of the same organism in maybe in 2 years and 3 years uh, i will find a different gene sequence because microorganisms are evolving much more faster because always they have they need to grow and they need to multiply and that's multiply and that's why we need they are much more smarter than human so um with that i'll be happy to take any question and thank you so much for listening to my presentation uh, thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much for conveying your knowledge through this presentation we will go ahead with some questions now sure. and over to sumati ma'am for question session thank you for the wonderful lecture ma'am uh, you have given clear picture about the oral microbiome and then phytotherapeutic approach and then uh, uh, measures to uh, uh, measures to quantify or quali uh, quantify the oral microbiome and all those uh, it was really informative for our students i have few questions from the students side ma'am mm. yes yeah so the question from dr murali is can unrelated organism interfere with implication of diseases great question so um for example we always uh, uh, we when we are looking at like uh, that's quite uh, possible also so for example is it is uh, the question is more specific to like uh, the culturable versus the unculturable so for example for example like you know in one of my slide i mentioned that culturable means like we can culture the bacteria and we can uh, move for, further like you know we can add on in terms of identification 
But if it is like sometimes dead microorganisms also they are leaving and that, that can also cause, uh, contribute to like an extension of the disease. So there is a possibility. Okay. Uh, can we quantify the individual species by this DTG method, ma'am? Yes. We can uh, quantify. Uh, the, the, the thing is that like, you now we have to extract the DNA and then again, like now from that, again, we have to elude the DNA and then again, we can measure that. But that will be an indirect approach of like getting the quantification. That's moreover, I will say qualitative method. Yeah. So it will not be quantified, no, ma'am. It cannot be quantified as such. It it's cannot be quantified. It's I will say like you know, it's a qualitative approach, not a quantitative approach. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Next, uh, is it cost effective, madam? The NGS method you have mentioned, is it cost effective, ma'am? The uh, the NGS method. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So next generation sequencing is uh, now I will say like you know anything any new technology when it is available like you know definitely when we look at the cost it's a little bit expensive as compared to the um, rest of the methods but definitely like you now we are saving a lot of times together let's say like you know I have I have to look for 100 microorganisms then it will it will take more time for me to do real time PCR or regular PCR. But if I do the next generation sequencing, then there is a, that, that that's the one of the most uh, like you know appropriate method in comparing those hundred microorganisms in a very less span of time. So depending on like you know which method we are following, some are expensive, expensive and some are real cost effective. But I will rather go for like you know which one is uh, saving time. I give my sample and if I'm getting my data in 48 hours versus I give my sample and I'm still waiting for six months or three months to get my data. So there lies the difference. That's a great question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Next question is, uh, is it uh, available in this facility available in India, ma'am? Next generation sequencing, yes. Okay. It is available in, there are many companies there, uh, like, you know, you need to, I, and also there, it's available in many institutes also, because we have the, uh, there in Delhi, there is, uh, I think it's in Hyderabad, in many places, actually in Delhi, in Hyderabad, in many parts of India, this technology is, this facility is available. Uh, next question is, ma'am, can we alter the oral microbiome by diet based on the copy number? Can we generalize this study? Great question. Yes, that's what is like, you know. So the best approach is also now uh, if you, the the latest trend is again, like, you know, we, we are having, for example, like, you know, probiotic, right? If you get probiotic, then you are kind of artificially introducing safe microorganisms to your gut. The same thing, we are also having a similar type of approach by changing the food habitat and also like, you know, managing our diet not only managing like the quantity duration everything like you know that will also kind of like help in changing the oral microbiome and i'm sorry it's the next uh, I, I think it has two part right what is the last part of the question based on the copy number can we generalize the study so if taking that's a good study, question yeah. uh based on the copy number that's like you know we cannot say unless and until we see and we compare like how what exactly we used to have uh, previously and then after more altering the diet or modifying the diet what is the so we have to compare and then only we can say that's a very good question actually thank you ma'am next question is uh, can phytochemicals counteract the toxicity of allopathic drugs very good. <laughs> Always, that's a big debate, actually, right? Because yeah. most of the that's that's actually that's where we always face the when it comes to human trial. Always, that's the one of the difficult question. But 
most of these, uh, um, I, again, like here we have uh, the FDA, the Federal uh, Drug Agency, which is uh, deciding all these things. Uh, and any time you go to pharmacy and you buy something like in a particularly uh, over the counter medication or plant based, you will see like, you know, there is a tag that says it has been FDA approved or it has not been FDA approved. So again, coming back to the question, like you know, whether it is interfering or not, usually if you are taking a dietary supplement, there should be a gap in between your allopathic medicine and the dietary supplement or any plant-based medicine. Usually there people say, like, you know, I mean, scientifically, there is no proven result that like you know whether it interferes or not. But that's a good question to like, you know, it has to be really evaluated. And that's where lies the human trial. Yes. Next question is, are phytotherapy compared with gold standard drugs, ma'am, phytochemicals, what we are using, do we compare during the study, do we compare with the gold standard drugs? Uh, good question. We always have a positive control and we always have a negative control. So, for example, like, you know, whenever we are comparing uh, any antimicrobial property of any plant-based product, we always culture use the... Uh, uh, we always use the antibiotics. That's the simple method, right? So, uh, so all I mean that is there, and then on that basis, like you know, we can compare, and there that surely we have to we we have to have a always like you know compare with the optimized control. One more question, ma'am. Do we have experimental yeah. evidences for safety of phytochemical therapy? um great question and uh, sometimes what happen like in you know, a randomly we cannot let's say like i know a plant is having any uh, antifungal property or antibacterial property right some are edible some are non edible so we have to be extra careful like you know if it is not non edible and also like you know if there is if it is like you know there is some side effect of that so that has to be done. That has to be really carefully, like when we are extracting, we have to go through a series of extraction method wherein we are getting rid of the harmful part of that particular phytotherapeutic extract. And then we are further purifying, you know, to make it like, you know, safe uh, and edible form. I believe I answer, his question, answer the question. Yes, ma'am, for sure. Uh, next question is adverse effects if reported. What will be the remedial measure in phytopharmacological approach? Great question. And the adverse effects are like, you know, we have to look for where exactly it is targeting. If we know the target, like, you know, sometimes we have different type of receptor, right? So whether it is uh, what kind of receptor, if the receptor is same or receptor is different based on that, because Randomly, the moment we are taking any medication or any anything like, you know, there are many things happening without our knowledge, right? By the time we are getting the symptoms or getting some changes, that's really a long time. So in between that, we have to, in order to find out, like we need to uh, follow an approach wherein we have to look for the target, whether these two particular, like, you know, is there any interference with one specific target or different targets and receptors so that we have have to study and very like you know that is what is either we have to have the in vivo assay or in vitro assay and then we have to compare everything so that's what is another uh, like you know uh, part of, of always even for the phytotherapeutic approach we have to always like you know follow that thank you ma'am uh, ramya has few more questions from her side ramya, ramya can sure you? i'm glad that like now yeah absolutely <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Ramya. Yes, ma'am, uh, ma is there uh, yes. is there any cytotherapeutic approaches or any studies uh, for uh, oral mucormycosis, which is caused after uh, COVID-19, ma'am? Is there any studies for... Great question, actually. 
Uh, I think there are some of the studies available. I didn't do, I mean, uh, there are studies available. So for example, like, you know, uh, overall, if you look at the public database, many people are complaining about the change in uh, like, uh, dental problem has been increased significantly. That's for sure during the COVID time. Because what happening is that we are wearing masks and we are limiting some of the like, you know, uh, kind of, uh, when we are wearing masks, like, you know, based on our saliva pH, it's changing. And there are many things changing in the oral microbiome, I mean, oral uh, ecosystem itself. So that has been significantly uh, impacted. But uh, there are many reports I don't have right away in front of me. But there are many reports, which is, again, like, and it's, and it's a ongoing study also, how it's uh, changing the oral microbiome during the okay. COVID time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because COVID time, I myself, like, you know, if I'll be sitting, uh, I feel like, you know, I need to munch something, let me eat something and kind of like uh, change our uh, feeding habitat. And I mean, feeding habit. And there are many things like, you know, we have uh, in between wearing the mask and also like, you know, so there are many changes. So significantly, definitely it has been, um, it, it has impacted the oral microbiome for sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your patience in answering all the all these questions. Uh, over to Ramya again. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable time spent teaching the participants on the oral microbiome, PCR analysis, and phy uh, phytotherapeutic approaches. We have definitely gained vast knowledge on this. I would like to also thank the uh, institution, Sri Balaji Dental College and Hospital and Dr. Sumati Jones, head of the Department of Pharmacology for conducting series of webinar on Dentopharm 2022. Principal Sir, Dr. Jimson, and the organizing committee, Dr. Uh, Satish and uh, Mr. N.P. Murli. A special thanks to Dr. Nishad Sheikh and Angelin from Doc Mood organization for the technical support. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you and like you know i'm sure it's and wish you all happy 75th independence day have a great thank weekend. you ma'am thank you thank you ma thank and you. one more announcement for the participants for next year we have uh, for next week we have a webinar series number four which will be the the brochure will be distributed to the participants and I, I kindly request the participants to participate for, tomorrow, uh, for next week's webinar also. Thank you.